opportunity to be in his presence one more time. And I greet you with the words of Psalm 134 and 1, which says, Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Yes, God woke us up this morning, started us on our way. He blessed us with anointed water. Yes, that's right. Make sure that when you join us on these lives on Tuesday nights that you get your blessed water or your blessed diet root beer or your blessed, uh, what else is it that I love to have? Diet Pepsi with cherry in it. So again, it's so good to see you. Bless you, Deacon Trout. I trust that each and every one of you have had a wonderful and awesome Thanksgiving holiday and celebration. Some of you saw the fact that the family and I, we were able to get away, Elder Johnson, for a few days. And um, yes, we got a whole lot done in a short amount of time. The ocean, uh, Orlando, Florida, uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, Disney World, um, even in Chattanooga, we stopped. And of course, the family sometimes think uh, that I've lost it. Uh, we got to see the Chattanooga Choo Choo. They had never heard of it. And they're like, what is the, you know, have you lost your mind? What's, what is it? But I definitely love, uh, definitely we'll be praying for it. We're praying for someone that is experiencing anxiety right now. And we'll be lifting you up in our prayer. Let me write that down. And that is Quincy. Quincy, we're praying for you, Quincy. But we got to see the Chattanooga Choo Choo and so many other things. Uh, some of you, bless you, uh, uh, Adjutant General Rudolph. Some of you um, have asked a question, they're like, Hankerson, you just go like 40 going west, and uh, when do you ever stop? Uh, but don't fool yourself. I know how to pace myself. Um, yes, we were just in Houston on yesterday with the uh, Nelson family. Uh, Vice President Sellers is going to be getting married uh, this coming Thursday. We'll be with him, and then also on Friday, we'll be in the consecration with the Bishop-designate Linwood Dillard. And at that time, I will be handing over my crown. That's right. That's right. What you going to do, Hankerson? You're going to heaven. You're dying. Going to exchange your cross for a crown? No. Um, still, I am still have my cross. And uh, uh, not just this cross, but I'm talking about the cross that we carry every day. And then also I'll get that crown when I get to heaven. But nevertheless, I have the crown right now until Friday of the youngest. Bless you, Elder Obi. Youngest. Um, domestic jurisdictional bishop in the entire Church of God in Christ. And I've had that uh, unofficial title for about four years now, and we're getting ready to turn that over to Bishop Dillard, and uh, he will have that title. And I inherited that from Bishop Tyrone Butler, if he's on the line. He was the youngest, and before him was, I think, Bishop Douglas out of uh, Kansas City. And there's so many others of you that are watching right now that God is going to anoint you, and God is going to use you in a great way. So be encouraged. Your time is coming. I know that if he can use me, if God can use anything, uh, he can use me. And if God can use me, he can use anybody. So there's nothing more blessed in your life than to have God to use you for his glory. And uh, thank God for all the high offices and uh, positions and functions in the body. But I mean, when God anoints you, there's just nothing like being anointed by God. It is the most wonderful thing that you can ever experience in your life. So seek God's face and God will anoint you and use you in a great way. Uh, listen, as we get ready to go into the topic today, also don't forget, uh, don't forget that uh, when you write, write legibly. Don't write like Ankerson where you write something you can't even read what your handwriting is. Oh yeah, that's right. Next week we'll be in Florida. Be sure to join us in Florida. I'm trying to see where we'll be at. We will be somewhere in Florida next week. And so I'll be announcing about that. So if you're in the state of Florida, we'll be preaching in Florida next week. And then also we're getting ready to head to Atlanta, Georgia. We're heading to Memphis, Tennessee. We'll be at the Pentecostal Temple Church of God in Christ, pastored by the Bishop Charles Harrison Mason Patterson. That's coming up as well. And speaking of him, don't forget that Life Center celebrates 20 years. Life Center celebrates 20 years next year. And I thank God for him giving me the strength to be able to be faithful to my wife, faithful to my children, faithful to my family, faithful to my local church, to my jurisdiction, to my uh, job with the clergy coalition, to the Department of Evangelism, to the jurisdiction, uh, most of all being faithful to God. God is the one that's given me the strength to be able to do that. How do you do it, Hankerson, without burning out? Well, let me tell you one thing. Uh, when I go home, I have learned when my when my head hits the pillow, 
I'm not, we, we have a brother Jacob that's a member of this church, sings a song. I ain't worried about nothing. I don't worry about anything. I don't carry my problems to sleep with me. I lay down, I give it to God, and I say, God, if you can't fix it, there's no way that I can fix it. No need of both of us staying up all night long. You go ahead and you handle it. And if you can't do it, it cannot be done. And God can do anything but fail. I feel him right now. God can do anything but fail. And so appreciate you, Sister Young. God bless you. God bless everybody. So good to see you. So we'll be celebrating 20 years next month, next, starting the next month. Uh, wait a minute. Is this, this is still November. Okay, starting month after next, starting in January, our local church will be celebrating 20 years. Lemuel F. Thuston, chairman of the General Assembly of the Church of God in Christ, will be our speaker on the fourth Sunday. And then also our uh, 20th pastoral anniversary will be in September, September 29th. Bishop Charles Harrison Mason Patterson will be preaching uh, that particular service. So again, I trust that all of you have had a wonderful holiday and you have another holiday coming up, which is Christmas. You have New Year's. And uh, I believe that God is going to bless his people. We're speaking increase over the membership of Life Center in 2019. That's the word that God told me to give his people here at the Life Center International Church. My God, and I'm excited about it. Once I get off the line with you all, as you know, I try to be home uh, on Sundays as well as Tuesdays. I'm on the road a whole lot, but I try to make sure that I'm committed to Sundays at my local church as well as to Tuesday night Bible study. I love teaching the word of God. And like I shared with you right now, yeah, yeah, come on and join us, Brother Osmer. Come on and join us. Have a wonderful time. This is a word church. We're shouting church, dancing church. Some of you saw that on uh, uh, Facebook Live a few weeks ago when we had our family and friends day. We don't always do live because it's kind of hard to translate a Pentecostal service onto camera. It's very difficult. And, you know, that will be the Sunday that, um, you know, one of our elders jumps out the pulpit, runs down the aisle and all of that. And, you know, we just enjoy the Lord. But some of that doesn't always translate too well onto camera. But somebody told me, man, said, put it out there. That's what the saints want to see. They want to see the saints rejoicing. But I, I came up in a time where um, under Bishop Westbrook, that was considered so sacred. And even when the shouting would start, he would cut the tape on the radio broadcast and say, no, that's a sacred time when the saints are worshiping and people may ridicule our form of worship, uh, but it is biblical. He says to praise him in the dance, praise him with the high sounding cymbals. You praise him uh, with, with tambourines and with harps, and that's how he tells us to worship. So everyone doesn't necessarily understand that, and so we're trying to work things out where we can um, uh, get our worship service on, where some of you can join in with us, but we are definitely a word-based church. These members uh, learn the word of God on a regular basis, and what I was saying is that um, in the future when I retire, somebody's saying, when, when is he going to retire? I'm not retiring any, not not soon, but um, uh, in the future once I've retired from um, the different offices and things like that that I have in the body of Christ, that's definitely what I want to do is spend the latter end of my life mentoring and teaching the word of God to anyone that will listen. And so, again, I appreciate you. And let's get into this question right now. And let's pray. We're praying for you, Brenda. Brenda is saying she's experiencing anxiety attacks even right now. Saints, can you just say a word of prayer for our dear sister right now as we pray and go into the word? Father, will you touch Brenda right now in the name of Jesus? We declare peace right now where there is confusion. Dear God, we pray right now that you would touch and arrest that mind, cast the devil out of the mind that comes to disturb the peace. He comes to bring uh, confusion. He comes to tear it down. But I thank you right now for lifting our dear sister by the power of God. Father, you gave us the weapons of your word. You gave us the weapons of the blood. And we apply those weapons right now to our dear sister and to everyone that's listening that's dealing with uh, possibly the, the holiday blues that they call them. Uh, Father, I pray that you would lift them right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And we thank you and we give you glory because God, nothing's going to stop us from praying. Hey, glory to God. Glory. Nothing's going to stop us from praising you. Thank you, Jesus. Nothing's going to stop us from magnifying you. And we give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. Holy Ghost is uh, touching me. He gave me a word today in regard. There's um, someone that was uh, uh, dealing with illness in their body, and actually the enemy was trying to uh, shut them up. And uh, God gave me the scripture, muzzle not the ox. And I know that when you all hear that scripture, you're thinking about, okay, that means pay the preacher, you know, let him eat some corn and all of that. But when you think about the muzzle, 
uh, when you think about muzzling somebody, a muzzle is not something just to stop you from biting. It's not something to just stop you from eating. It's something that literally tries to shut you up when you go to try to muzzle somebody. Uh, that, that's someone trying to uh, shut that person down. And so many times the enemy wants to shut down your praise, wants to shut down the anointing that is on your life, tell you to shut up, have you feeling condemned, like you don't have no, you better sit down and shut up. You don't have no right to praise God. You don't have no right for God to use you when you look at your past and all these different things that have happened in your life. But you need to let the enemy know you're not going to muzzle me. You're not going to shut me down and I'm not going to be shut out. And so I praise God and thank God uh, for you. Let me answer that uh, well, I can answer that now. Someone's asked me a question, do I ever wear jeans or am I always dressed in the nines? Now, you know, I don't know what um, uh, all the different hip sayings are, dressed to the nines. I guess that means, uh, I don't know, explain, <laughs> explain that one to me. Somebody asked me, do I ever wear jeans? I do wear jeans. I wear jeans and um, you can go to my Facebook page and go look there and you can see um, where I'm in jeans when we were on the beach. So I wasn't in a three-piece suit or class A on the, uh, I, I'm sure dressed to the nines, that's something, I think that's something uh, positive. Yeah, always clean. Well, thank you so much. That's so kind of you. I appreciate that. Um, thank you so much. But yes, I do wear jeans as well as, um, uh, what do you call those, tennis shoes as well uh, during my casual times. But let's get into this question right now. I want you to invite somebody to join in with us as we deal with this question. Are you going to hell if you don't go to church? Are you going to hell if you're not a member of a church? Well, let's start off by saying first by first case uh, when it comes to uh, church attendance that's a case-by-case -case basis and so I cannot say right now and I don't think anyone can say if a person does not go to church at all uh, they're going to hell now let me qualify that statement because some of you are ready to throw rocks at me through the screen right now the reason why I say that is because uh, you have people that are homebound for example I know of individuals that served in church for years uh, faithful to God, uh, faithful in their relationship with God, and uh, they reached an age where their body just began to decay, and many uh, have, have gone, and some are right now in convalescent centers, and they're not able to attend church anymore like they did at one time. Uh, I strongly don't believe that someone in that particular condition is going to hell because they're not able to get out to service like they did at one time. My late grandfather had a stroke in 1987. He passed away in 1990, three years later. Uh, during the course of that time, even though he had been a pastor for well over 50 years, um, it was a massive, major stroke that he experienced. He was completely bedridden. Uh, it took his sight, it took his speech, um, he was not able to, to move. And a matter of fact, uh, when it comes to loved ones in hospitals, please make sure that you stick with them and just don't leave them there by themselves. Because uh, when he first suffered the stroke, he would sing and do different things. And so they thought, uh, they didn't understand, you know, somebody, you know, with sanctified people, we're going to sing and give God praise, give vent to God. Um, they didn't understand that. They thought he was in pain and couldn't understand his singing and could not understand his praise. And they ended up, when we weren't around, putting some medication in him, uh, calling themselves putting a sedative in him, sedating him. And uh, from that point forward, he just went downhill where he was almost in a vegetative state and uh, not able to function. Now, three years, for the last three years of his life, he was not able to attend church. He was not able to go to church. I don't think um, God would send a person to hell uh, based on the Word of God. Again, I'm not giving you my opinions. I'm just uh, going totally based on Scripture. I can't see Scripture uh, for that that would say, well, because that person uh, did not does not go to church anymore and they are um, bedridden, basically, they're going to hell. You cannot find that in Scripture. So that's why I say it has to be a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not talking about the person that's just staying home. Oh, I think it's going to rain outside. Oh, I don't feel like going today. Or oh, I don't have any uh, shoes to wear. It's nothing but a fashion show. And so I don't have, I'm not referring to somebody like that. That's a person that's making uh, excuses. And the scripture does refer to people making excuses. Well, I got to first of all go and bury uh, the dead. I have to go and get married first. And Jesus says, uh, listen, let the dead bury the dead. He wasn't saying, don't worry about your loved ones. He wasn't saying, don't get married. He was basically saying, stop making excuses. And so the scripture does um, address making excuses. Also, what are you going to do about people in nations 
For example, many of the Muslim nations, it is a cardinal sin and crime against the nation uh, and a crime against Islam to convert to Christianity in many of those Muslim nations. And so therefore, it's something that you definitely uh, cannot make known because if you do, you will end up being executed. And it's in places like that where some of those individuals are actually uh, tuned in electronically by internet or by uh, sometimes, sometimes in some cases, Christian uh, television. And so I do, I am aware of cases like that in places where it's really illegal to convert. Now, if you come into the nation as somebody that is um, already a Christian, you know, they definitely are going to, uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? They're definitely going to um, not treat you with equal rights as they will someone else that is a part of the Muslim faith. Uh, but definitely you are not to try to proselytize somebody from Islam. Uh, and definitely if someone converts, that is considered a crime. For example, in Mecca, uh, there in Saudi Arabia, only Muslims are allowed in the city of Mecca because that is like the most holy site to those that are uh, Islamic. And so in that particular uh, case, if someone converts, then it's definitely against the law. They will lose their life. And so you have the cases like that in those particular nations. Again, we're not referring to people uh, that, that's right. You have to attend. We're not referring to people making excuses. Oh, I just don't feel well. Oh, I got hurt in the church. Listen, everybody, you, you know what? We've all got hurt in the church. We've all got hurt on our jobs. We've all got hurt on our, in our families. And I know that you would think church is supposed to be the last place that you get hurt, but the church is made up of people. The late Bishop Westbrook used to state this. He used to state that, um, you know, there was this parable that someone told when Jesus ascended on high and um, uh, they asked him the question, said, well, you know, this faith that you have left, who did you leave it in the hands of? And he pointed to the 12 apostles and the followers uh, of Jesus Christ. And they looked, they said, oh, my goodness, you left everything in their hands. And uh, the response in this particular parable, the response that Christ made was, that's all that I have. And so we are all that he has. And we are people and people are going to hurt you. People are going to disappoint you. Uh, people are going to get on your nerves. And I know many times there's many of you that feel like, well, let me just go to church and leave and not get involved in anything. And then maybe I can uh, stay away from some of the drama. Um, well, according to the, the scriptures, he saved us uh, to serve. The son of man did not come to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life a ransom. So really it's, it's, it's uh, required of us to serve, to serve in some type of ministerial capacity. I'm not necessarily referring to you being the president of a committee or an organization, but we are saved by grace and we are, that are saved by grace are to serve. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ and the atoning work that he's done. We're justified by faith, but the scriptures also mentioned in the book of James, we're justified by our works. What does that mean? If we've truly been justified, then what ends up happening is we will serve. There are works that are gonna follow. We're not saved by those works, but we do those works because we have truly been saved. So again, people can make excuses. Again, all of us have been hurt. Don't let those of us that are in these high offices in the church fool you. Uh, we just have a good church face is what it is. Because many times when you say, hey, I'm leaving, I'm ready to turn in my letter in, I'm ready to turn in my resignation. If it wasn't for the grace of God, many of us would be right behind you. Because somebody may say, well, all this money that you all as preachers make, first of all, you know, when you talk about all this money, when you find it, let me know. I'm just like, here, uh, when you find him, let me know so I can come and worship him too. So when you find all this money, you know, uh, uh, people that are in ministry in the church do not make anywhere near uh, what people make uh, uh, that are in secular fields, uh, which are um, congruent to fields of management that you're in in the church. I uh, just recently was talking with someone that served on numerous boards in a certain city. And um, that gentleman just on one board alone that he was serving on had made $1.5 million. I'm not talking about his job. I'm not talking about his career. I'm talking about he served on various boards. You know, you can serve on the board for the hospital. You can serve on the board for whatever in your particular city. And there were numerous boards he served on, and on just one board, did y'all hear me? On just one board, 
uh, because on, on some boards you get paid for serving on those boards, and on just one board alone, he made $1.5 million just on one board. And so I don't know any preachers that are on numerous, maybe there are on numerous boards that are you know, making all of that kind of uh, money. So preachers are not making all the money that you uh, think that they're making. And then, you know, if you're in a certain career, uh, you 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 receive your money. They may try to take out taxes or whatever like that. And there's ways to kind of uh, uh, get some benefits when it comes to your taxation. Uh, but you're not giving back a certain portion of that money to Exxon or Mobile or whoever. But then when it comes to the church, I would hope and trust and pray that anybody that's high up in ministry is also tithing and giving of their increase to God. And so even what you receive, you're giving back. You're sowing seeds into other ministries and all. And so a lot of times for the money that you receive uh, compared to the trouble that you deal with, a lot of times it's, it just, if in the natural, it's not worth it. I'm just going to tell you, in the natural, it is not worth it. You have to be in this because you love God and because you love people, all right? You have to love people definitely, and people are going to hurt you. That is going to happen. Let me give an example. The family, we had went down to Galveston, Texas a few years ago on one of our many family vacations that we go to. Yeah, I hear you, Sister Hampton. She says, where's that organization at so I can serve on the board? Hey, me first and then you, okay? Um, but the family went down to Galveston, Texas, and um, down there on the beach, you have all these seagulls and all. And so uh, we had some scraps from the restaurant and we pulled out them scraps and, you know, you put them up and the birds just come from every place. And so that that was an, an enjoyment to me as a dad to sit back and watch my kids laughing and, you know, throwing up French fries and pieces of bread and all that and birds coming from every place. And next thing you know, I think it was Matthew, bless you, bless you Elder Hooker, Pastor Hooker, Pastor Chris Hooker. Next thing you know, Matthew, uh, one of the kids was just screaming, ah! We said, oh, no, what happened? He said, this bird has pooped on me. These birds have, well, uh, nicer word, these birds have placed feces on me. And so feces, I mean, just a big old glob. And, of course, you know, the rest of the kids had a big field day off of that, just laughing because there's all this big white glob of feces uh, and waste is just all over them. And that was a lesson. Uh, to me, and that's a lesson to many of you, a lot of times the same people you're trying to help will poop on you. A lot of times the same people that you're just simply trying to do something to benefit them, they're the ones that will mess all over you. You know, the birds, you know, they have to scrape around and, and scavenge to get food, and here we are trying to give them something nice, and they, they put feces all over us. And so that's going to happen in church, but nothing should stop you from coming to the house of God. Well, it's just a building and you don't have to uh, come together with Christians in order to uh, be saved. Well, let's go further into this. Um, there's a growing trend right now. And Pastor Hooker and those of you that are in ministry, um, realize this, hear what I'm saying. I'm not a prophet in the sense of someone calling you out and saying certain specific things in regard to maybe a word of knowledge about you, but I do believe, I strongly believe that there is a prophetic anointing on my life. There is an apostolic uh, anointing that is on my life. And periodically, it's not every day, it's not every month, uh, sometimes it's on a rarity, but there are times when God will deal with me in regard to times and seasons that we're in. And as far as trends, uh, even that affect the church, affect the nation and affect the body of Christ. Realize this, I believe that as we go into the next 10 or 20 years in the body of Christ, should Jesus tarry, I believe the church is going to get larger by getting smaller. Um, for a while, having a mega church or mega ministry has been the big thing. Uh, but what you're going to find out is that, yeah, but what you're going to, good, good, good point that you made. But what you're going to find out um, is that the people that we're trying to reach, now those of us in church, we are impressed with um, you know, $20 million buildings. We are impressed with big budgets. We are impressed with a whole lot of members. We're impressed with um, a whole lot of staff. That's wonderful. But the people that we're seeking to reach could care less about that. They're looking for relationship. There's been a breakdown in the family. And because there's been a breakdown in the family, there are people that will go to a church meeting in a restaurant somewhere because there's relationship versus me being in a place where there are 
30,000 members. I'm just a voice, a face in the crowd, and the pastor doesn't even know who I am, and the rest of the saints do not even know who I am. So you watch that trend. You're going to start to see that happen, I would say, in the next 10 to 20 years. Again, how God deals with me prophetically is not just, well, this is going to happen next week or whatever. It may be something down the line. Things that are happening uh, now, many of these things God showed me when I was 12 years old, when I was 15 years old. And so that's just how he deals with me, and that's how he uses me. And it's not in a sense of, um, you know, tomorrow this is going to happen. In 24 hours, that's going to happen. Sometimes there's people that God uses in that particular manner. But I want you to watch that, and I want you to understand that that's the, 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 the way that the direction that things are going to go. You're still going to have huge churches. Uh, you're still going to have large ministries. So don't let anybody get discouraged by hearing me say that. But I'm saying that that is really the direction you're going to have house churches, you're going to have small um, uh, apostolic organizations. When I say apostolic, I'm talking about the, 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 the ministry of church planting and, and uh, coming together almost in the sense like how Paul did, where there were a certain number of churches that he founded, and there were assistants that helped him to minister to the leaders and the uh, members of those particular churches, and they were very tight-knit, very close you know, the, the church in Jerusalem was uh, suffering a famine, was about to come. Prophet said that this is what's going to happen. So they began to gather things that they could send to Jerusalem to help those saints. You're going to see that trend uh, starting to take place because even America is starting to turn totally away. Uh, it, it never was a Christian nation in the sense of everybody saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and all the founders were just so committed to God, but it was Christian in the sense of the culture, which definitely made it possible for us to experience a couple great awakenings, to experience a holiness revival, to experience a uh, uh, Pentecostal revival of the early 1900s and then a refreshing of the 1930s, the latter rain movement and the healing and deliverance movement of the 19. 50s. You had uh, the charismatic renewal of the 1960s, the Pensacola outpouring 1995, the Toronto blessing. But if you notice, you are seeing those revivals less and less as you did years ago. It used to be a time where one thing would follow the next. You know, you get right out of the charismatic renewal and here is something else. You get right out of the uh, healing movement of the 1940s and 50s where you had the tent crusades and here is something else. Well, the last time there's really been a nationwide massive revival to hit our nation was 1995. And you can Google that when you get a chance about the Pensacola outpouring uh, that took place. Many of us were affected by that tremendous revival. Well, 1995, you're looking at a long time ago. Uh, yes, you have. Somebody might say, well, no, that ain't right, Hankerson. At my local church, you see, when, when you think about an apostolic anointing, the, the apostolic anointing does not just look at a local church. And we, 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 we're more independent-minded and just focused on uh, just our local assembly. But when it comes to the ministry of the apostle, they're concerned about the body as a whole. The late Charles Harrison Mason was an apostle. And as a result, he was concerned not just about his local church, but he was concerned about the nation, concerned about the body of Christ experiencing a holiness movement going back to consecration uh, before God, living a sanctified and living a righteous life. And so as we have become more independent minded and just focused on me, myself and I, as the nation begins to turn away uh, from its quote unquote Christian uh, culture. I, again, I don't want to say that the nation has had a relationship with God, but I'm saying that the culture was set so uh, the atmosphere, like somebody may say, was set so that you could experience these different revivals and movements because most people had some kind of knowledge of the Christian faith. Most people had some kind of experience of at least going to church. That trend is totally changing. There is a group now that is called the nuns, the nuns, not N-U-N-S, but N-O-N-E-S. Look it up when you get a chance, Google it. And it's a growing number of individuals, and this is a part of our topic tonight, it's a growing number of individuals that they're growing by the millions that are saying, I'm a spiritual person. I love God. I, um, I, I even believe in the Bible. I believe in miracles. I pray. Um, I believe in trying to live a righteous life. But as far as participating in a local church, you got, thank you, Sister Hampton. If those of you that are on um, 
Periscope, if you go to my Facebook page, they're, they're bringing up all these stuff. That's what I'm saying. If I, if I share something, feel free to Google it, and you can uh, look it up and be old-fashioned, too. Go to the library and, and pull it up. But the nuns are basically saying, I'm not committed to uh, organized religion. I'm not committed to the church because, believe it or not, organized religion has turned off a whole lot of people. A lot of people get really disillusioned by a lot of things that they see in church. But again, that's why I preface this lesson by telling you at the beginning, the church is made up of people and people are fallible. People are not Jesus. You know, we all make up the body of Christ, but people will let you down. But realize this, and, and thank you so much for the statement that was made on Periscope. Realize this, no matter how crazy church acts, no matter how stupid folks act in the church, no matter how ridiculous people treat you in the church, no matter how bad you were hurt, salvation is yet found within the church because it's the church that Jesus talked to and said, you all go and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark chapter 16. He is the one that said through the apostle Paul and Romans 10, how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach except they be sent? The ministry of the preacher abides within the church. The ministry of the preaching of the gospel abides within the church. It's the same way in the Old Testament. I don't care how. Matter of fact, God, in, in, one, in one particular passage, he said that you, you're just like backslidden heifers is what you are. You're going backwards. But no matter how backwards they went, the covenants were found in the nation of Israel. And that's why the apostle Paul had to correct the Gentile believers in the book of Romans and say, listen, don't you get an arrogant attitude against Israel? Because realize this, you were grafted in to the family. All of the covenants, all of these promises that God made to humanity, it has all come through the nation of Israel. And now we are spiritual Israel. And it's in this spiritual Israel, which is, it, which is the body of Christ, that you are able to find that redemptive work of salvation because it is through the church. And we're going to deal with that in a few minutes as well, that you have the ordinances, the orders, even the scriptures have been uh, compiled through the church, through the body of Christ. So again, there's a growing trend of internet church, internet membership, and I have nothing against that because there's even people that watch me on a regular basis uh, that have stopped going to church. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna be, can I be transparent with you? I have members of Life Center International Church that you may not see on a regular basis uh, sitting in the pews that I'm seeing on a regular basis getting the teaching across the internet. Uh, I, I, I see them on a regular basis. And of course, uh, our thing is come on back home, come on back home, uh, just like the prodigal son, come on back home and get busy for God and get involved in the work of the church, in the work of the Lord, because the church is the body of Christ. You can't separate the two. The body, the church is his body. The church is a body of baptized believers. It's the ecclesias, the called out ones, the ones that have been separated from the world and consecrated unto him. We are his body. Again, uh, pastors and leaders, there's there's growing trend of internet membership. <clears throat> I believe that that is a part of the work of evangelism because you have to start off um, with, uh, Sister Hampton, you put them hearts up there. I wasn't talking about you because I just saw you at church a few weeks ago, okay? I'm type pastor. I'm, when it comes to names, I'm horrible on names. I'm horrible on names. I'm horrible on names. That's, that's something I, I have to work on on a constant basis. But I can look out. I don't care who who's before me. I can look out. I can see somebody. Well, I put my glasses on to do it. I can look out and I can see somebody all across the room. Oh, that's, that's, that's you know, that particular person. So, yeah, you were in church a few weeks ago, so I wasn't referring to you. But thank you so much for those hearts. Appreciate you. Um, internet, internet church, I think, is an evangelistic tool. And I think it's something that we as ministers need to look into because you got to start somewhere. And there are a lot of people. That's why Pentecostalism has become mainline and, and you know, front street right now because of Christian television. You, you do remember that there was a time prior to the 1980s um, when TBN and, and different Christian stations started really gaining prominence. I know that Oral Roberts was on TV back in the 50s and 60s and all, but that really wasn't widespread. 
um, like the Trinity Broadcasting Network and other networks. Uh, so therefore, most people looked at Pentecostals as some kind of cult. You know, that's 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 a cult over there. Those people are crazy. I remember coming up in the state of Washington where people would pass our churches and think, you know, these people are crazy. They would hear folks screaming, beating tambourines, drums going and all of that. And they were frightened. They were literally frightened of sanctified people. It, it was a respect, but it was also a fear because they didn't know what was going on inside. I mean, think about it. You know, those of us that are in uh, Christianity, there are certain faiths that we don't know anything about. And when you look at those particular faiths and look at their buildings, there's no windows on those buildings. So you know what's going on in there. For example, the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses have what they call the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. There's no windows, so you don't know what's going on in there. I've never been to a Jehovah's Witness gathering. I have no idea what goes on on the inside. The Mormons, usually uh, they have their temples, but they also have, um, I'll just call them a church. Uh, there's not a lot of, uh, yeah, definitely, there's not a lot of windows in those particular buildings, so you don't know what's going on in there. So it leads to speculation. So imagine you've not been in a Pentecostal church before, you pass the church, and in the state of Washington, how it was, especially during the summer, uh, you really didn't need an air condition because you, you, you didn't have a whole lot of humidity. It would get hot, but it just wasn't unbearable heat, and so you just open up the windows. And so for sanctified churches in the state of Washington, you could literally hear the worship service at least three blocks away. And so imagine you've not experienced that. You're hearing all of this noise. That sounds wonderful to those of us that are in the faith. But for other people, it's frightening. What is happening in there? Is there a riot? I hear people screaming. I hear the preacher hollering. And then they're talking some kind of language. One person said one time, oh, my goodness, it must be some kind of African language that they speak in order to get some kind of power. So what ended up happening once... Christian television gained a certain amount of prominence, then all of a sudden people could see what was going on inside these Pentecostal churches and everything became mainstream. They began to understand about the tongue talking and the anointing with oil. And now that is not a major deal as it was in times gone by where people where people would think that you were crazy. But nevertheless, because of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, because the growing trend of this nation turned away from its um, Christian culture, there are a lot of people that are coming up now that just have not experienced church, period. I'm not talking about a Pentecostal church. I'm talking about church, period, even in the black community. How many of you remember a time when everybody went to church? The wino went to church. The streetwalker went to church. The dope dealer went to church. On Sunday, everybody was in church. I remember a time everybody's church was packed. Every church was full. If it was a small church, it was packed. If it was a storefront, it was packed. If it was a big church building, it was packed because that was the culture. Everybody went to church. But that has changed now, even in the black community, where you have whole generations that have not been brought up in church. They don't know anything about Sunday school. They don't know anything about uh, YPWW. You talk to a lot of people now and say, YPWW on Sunday nights at 6.30. They're like, huh? But many of you remember that time, Sunday school, Sunday morning, morning service, start at 11 o'clock, get out around three o'clock in the afternoon, get your quick bite to eat or go to a three o'clock service, excited to get back for YPWW at 6.30 and couldn't wait for Sunday night service because it was on Sunday night that you could testify and that's when the saints would really go into a high praise during that praise and testimony service. Those days are behind us. And what you have now is you have tons of people that have not been raised in church, period. And they know nothing about that lifestyle. They know nothing. And uh, one thing I've tried to get away from as a preacher is getting them saying, oh, and you know the story because I'm finding out. 90% of you folks don't know the story, even folks in the church, because there are some people in the church that don't crack their Bible and open it up until they get to church. Matter of fact, they don't even buy a Bible. It's on the phone, and they don't look at it on the phone until they get to church. They may listen to some gospel music. They may listen to a devotional word here and there on the internet, but as far as reading and studying, and uh, that's why God is raising up people like Elder Michael Payton, the other um, uh, night. He had about 40,000 people uh, watching Sunday night Sunday school with our presiding bishop, Bishop Charles Edward Blake. And I want you all to understand, for some reason, I got this prophetic apostolic hat on me tonight. So I'm just 
in one of those uh, prophetic trends and moves right now. But that, that was prophetic. The reason that was prophetic is because in order for there to be a move of God, you have to first of all have a restoration and a revival of the word of God. That's why in the Bible, during the time of Ezra and during the time when revivals would take place, Hezekiah and all of that, the people would stand all day and hear the word of God. And as they heard God's word, then revival would break out. God would move in a great and a magnificent way. The further we get away from the Bible, the further you're going to get away from revival. Revival starts when people start going back to the word of God, not just your shouting and dancing, but going back to the word. That's why God raised up the prophets. The reason why God raised up the prophets was because the nation had pulled away from the law. The law, what was the law? The law was the word. And thy word, Psalm 119, 11, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so it's through the word that we're able to live a consecrated life for God so that God can bless us and God can use us. And for so long, the trend has got, got away from people really being hungry for the word. And so when I saw that the other night, God began to deal with me and said, listen, that is the framework and the foundation for revival being laid right now, the foundation. A lot of people can't even see it because they're thinking, oh, revival's just gonna fall out the sky. No, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Realize this, and if you get a chance, go to the Church of God in Christ Facebook page and look at that Sunday night, Sunday school. I think there's about 40,000 people that have viewed that Sunday school now. You may think, oh, it's just a Sunday school lesson. Oh, it's just presiding bishop talking. No, that is prophetic. When you can get 40,000 people simply hearing the word of God is through the word because the word is quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, even dividing asunder the soul from the spirit. The soul is our emotional realm, our, our mind, our intellect, our reasoning, but the spirit, that is where God abides and is through the leading of the spirit. As many as are led by the spirit of God, Romans 8, 14. These are the sons of God. And it's through that division that takes place, Hebrews 4 and 12, that your spirit man, your inner man, which is led by God, is able to take the preeminence over your soulish realm, which is your mind, your reasoning, your intellect. It literally brings every thought into captivity, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the casting down of imaginations and, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity every thought. That's what the word does. So I got excited the other night when I saw that. And as we go to the word, it's through the word again that we see what God requires. And again, to answer the question that is before us tonight, God requires that his people gather together on a regular basis. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Someone's been quoting it on Periscope the whole night. It says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching, as you see the day of the Lord approaching. So it is in the word of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, that the word says, and we can try to switch it around. Oh, it doesn't mean that. And I know the, the world looks at us like this too in this upcoming generation that we have now looks at us. We do do a lot of cherry picking in the scriptures. Uh, and we might as well admit that as preachers and as the body of Christ. That's one reason why people don't respect us a lot is because we they feel like we're not for real or we don't address certain things. And so yes, yes, we as the body of Christ, we as preachers have a tendency to cherry pick. If it's something that uh, we feel we can get away with, we're just kind of gloss over that and try to switch it around and try to change it around. Um, even the recent controversy that was on uh, social media in regards to the uh, homosexual lifestyle. I don't care how you try to twist the scriptures. I don't care how you try to turn it around. According to the scriptures, it's an abomination. And so people will try to say, well, you're cherry picking because the Bible also talks about not wearing different types of clothing and all of that. And so, yes, there's a lot of cherry picking that takes place. But I'm telling you, the word of God is plain. The word of God is right. And the word says for us not to forsake the assembling or the meeting together. Let us not give up meeting together. 
Now people are trying to twist it around and say, well, I can meet you on the internet. I can meet you on television. I can meet you on my phone. But we know what the word of God is saying. Let's go to uh, Psalm 50 and 5 if you really want to be uh, technical and specific. Psalm 50 and 5 says, gather my saints unto me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Gather, bring them together, bring the body together. Now, let me say this. Church attendance, and I want to say this, church attendance does not save, but saved people will attend church. Oh, that's good. Somebody put that down on the comment section uh, for us. Church attendance does not save you, all right? But saved people will attend church. And again, there's been a trend in the last 30, 40 years where people say, well, that's just another building and uh, it's a building made by hands and, and you don't have to come together. You can just love God and you don't have to gather together with the people of God. Well, where the saints meet is not just any kind of building. I know that's the mentality. Uh, and yes, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And yes, the church itself, the members of the body make up the church. But where we meet is sacred. It is very, very sacred. In Acts chapter 4, when the people of God assembled, God shook the building where they were at to show that he was present and to show that he was there. And so uh, um, he didn't shake the people. <laughs> he shook the building. And so he can move a lot of times even in inanimate objects. I'm going to make some of you really uh, get alarmed when I say this. Even when Jesus cast the uh, demons out of um, the gentleman, we, we, well, we call him Legion, but that wasn't his name. He said, what, what's your name? And they said, our name is, my name is Legion, for we are many. Uh, those demons actually went into a herd of swine. So you find spiritual things, a, 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 a spirit, a demon, going into animals. And so a lot of times, yes, there are inanimate objects that God can use. Look at the talking snake. And not only that, but also the shaking of the building, the shaking of Mount Horeb. God didn't necessarily shake the people, but when the people were gathered there and God said, listen, you know, uh, section everything off. Don't anybody touch the, the mountain or else you'll end up getting killed. Uh, there was the lightning, there was the smoke, and there was the shaking of the mountain. And when they saw that, that was a manifestation to them that God was present in that particular place. So wherever we gather together, wherever our praying ground is, that is a sacred place. And again, a lot of people will say, I don't want to go because folks are so messy. And yes, people are messy. Realize this, some people in the church, that's their entire life. They're not well-balanced people. I think if we as church people become well-balanced people, that will cut off some of the mess and some of the drama and some of the unnecessary talk that happens in church because you're a well-rounded person. Jesus was a well-rounded person. The prophets were very well-rounded. They knew, you know, as a prophet, you're in Jerusalem, but you know what's happening in Babylon. You know what's happening in Assyria. You know what's happening in Egypt. You know what's happening in Ethiopia. You know what's happening in Greece. You know, you look at the prophets like Ezekiel uh, and Daniel, people prophesying about Greece and Rome. So here they are living in Jerusalem, but they're very much aware of what's happening in uh, what we call modern day now Europe and Asia and Africa. They knew what was going on in three different continents. And so we as the people of God, when, when your mind is occupied with uplifting things and with edifying things, you don't have as much time to be so messy and to be in everybody else's life. The story is told about a preacher that had a, a, a lady in the church just gossip, gossip, was trying to find something on him and everything. She gossiped about everybody in the church, always had something to say. You know, I think this about the preacher. I think the preacher is this, and I think the preacher is that. And she just gossip and gossip and gossip and gossip and caused so much confusion to the time the preacher just got sick of it. He was tired of it. He was tired of, you know, her, her always trying to find something on him and find something on everybody else. So he said, I'm going to shut this down. I'm going to shut this gossip down now. And so the woman was single. And so what he did, he took his car and he parked his car that evening in front of the woman's house. He caught a taxi and he went home to his family and he left his car out at the woman's house all night long. Now, mind you, this is a single woman and the preacher's car is sitting in front of her house. He's gone home 
and I got that taxi and went home, and the car stayed there in front of that woman's house all night long. The next morning, he got the taxi back, went and picked his car up, and drove off. woman left him alone. He didn't have nothing else to say after that. And so, you know, sometimes you just have to nip some things in the bud, but realize this, people need to have other things in their life besides what's going on in somebody else's life. Study science, study what's happening in the world, become involved in your community. Be, let's be the salt. Bishop Blake gave us the theme about being the salt of the earth. Salt is no good in the salt shaker. Let's, let's, let's get involved with young people and helping young people to find jobs, mentoring people and, 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 and helping people to get involved in society and become constructive. Go to the jails. I'm the type of preacher, I, that's one reason why God has constantly blessed me is because I would never sit around and say, I'm waiting for some kind of opportunity to come my way. I would create opportunities. That's why I love nursing home ministries. We just get up, go to the nursing home. There's no such thing. When I first started off as a minister, wasn't even licensed. When I first started off as a minister, I was preaching two or three times every week. There was no such thing as not having engagements. I was preaching somewhere two and three times a week. I'm not talking about a lot of offerings and honorariums, but I was in nursing homes, on the street, just whatever my hands found to do. And in being busy and in being uh, productive and in being fruitful, you're fulfilled and therefore you don't have that spirit of intimidation by somebody else. Well, I'm intimidated because I'm not bearing no fruit and look at what they're doing and I'm jealous of them and envious of them and, and I have to find some kind of way to connive and cut them down because they have something I don't have. See, when your life is fruitful, you can celebrate other people. You can celebrate the blessings of God in their life. You can celebrate how God is using their ministry. You can excel them You, you or help, help them to excel. I've had liberal leaders that push me. Uh, the late Bishop T.L. Westbrook, I was preaching in convocations at the age of 18 years old. The late Bishop E. Harris Moore in my early 20s, he had me pastoring one of the mother churches in the jurisdiction that was probably about 80 years old at that particular time. The late Bishop Robert James Ward, who wrote the letter of recommendation and said, man, your district is growing. It's growing from five to seven to 30 to 40 churches. You, I'm going to write a letter of recommendation because I know you're not two-faced. I know you're not going to stab me in the back. I know you're not going to try to destroy my jurisdiction, but you're going to go out and you're going to win souls and, and reach people and, and all. And so that's what happens. God has given me those kind of leaders, and I dare not be the kind of person that does not reach out and try to help somebody else. And so when your life is fruitful, you're happy, you're content, and you don't go to sleep worrying about somebody else getting ahead of you. How can somebody else get ahead of you and you have your own assignment? If I've got my own assignment, nobody can get ahead of me and my assignment. That's my assignment and you have your assignment. And so you're, you're not battling against your brother or sister. You're, you're battling against the adversary. And you all know that he's already a defeated foe. The devil is already defeated. So don't let people stop you from going to church. You are a part of the body. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, it teaches us that God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers for the working of the ministry. God has given you a gift, and God wants you to utilize that gift for the edifying of the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, we know 11 says, and he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But notice this. It says that the body might be built up in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the stature of Christ. And we will speak the truth in love and all things grow up into him, which is the head. From him, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament. It grows and builds itself in love. So you are needed. Do not feel in fear. There's some of you watching right now. I mean, when you go to church, you just feel like you're lost. You feel like you're insignificant, maybe because you're not on the platform, maybe because you don't have the title that somebody else has. Listen, whatever it is that God has called you to do, it is important. And every ministry is not a platform ministry. Every ministry is not going to be on the forefront. I have met some powerful people in my life in the body of Christ that have never got behind a microphone. They have never preached behind the pulpit. They have never led a big massive crusade, but when you meet them, there was one lady, um, I don't wanna call her name, one lady in the state of Washington. And I tell you that dear sister was so anointed and powerful when she opened her mouth and prayed. 
I mean, the power of God would move like you would not believe. She never became an evangelist, never became a, a, a title holder, never held a particular position, served on the usher board. That was about it. But she was just a powerful prayer warrior. And the ministry of intercession really is a behind closed doors ministry. Matthew chapter six, when you pray, go into your prayer closet and shut yourself away. And so in the ministry of intercession, you're not always going to have an appreciation service or a love service or an official day uh, for yourself. And it's easy to make, you know, to sit there and feel like, you know, I'm, I'm sick of this. I'm not being appreciated, but I'm laboring and laboring and praying for everyone else. But realize if you weren't doing what you were doing, then the whole body would be in chaos because you need the intercessor. You need someone that is calling on the name of the Lord on a regular basis, covering the entire body in prayer. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 12, 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. You cannot live without those particular parts to the body. Your most precious parts to your body are never seen. And if they are, then the body is dead. And that is your brain, that is your heart, that's your lungs, that's your kidneys. These are parts of the body that you never do see. But without them, you would not be able to make it. You can't make it without a brain. You can't make it without a heart. So whatever part of the body that you are, you are definitely indispensable. You are needed. You are necessary. No, I'm not, Hankerson. If I left, nobody would even notice that, that I'm, I'm, I'm gone. Well, are you trying to get the praises of men? Or are you trying to be pleasing in the eyesight of God? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 25, there's not to be any division among us, but each part should have equal concern for each other. Wait a minute, equal concern? Hankerson, I thought it was the pastor's job to go and see about the sick. I thought it was the pastor's job to go to the hospitals and, and, and see about the members that aren't feeling well. Uh, well, according to the scripture, it says we're to all have equal concern for each other. What are we paying the preacher for? That's what we pay him to do. That's what we pay her to do so they can go. No, the Bible says that we have to have concern for each other. Let's not have that spirit of Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? Why are you asking me where, where my brother is at? Am I his keeper? Am I the one that watches over him? And that's how a lot of people feel even in the body of Christ. Why do I got to be worried about where Sister Garlic is at? Why do I got to be worried about uh, Brother... Um, Brother Toten Fetch, why do I have to be worried about where he is? Just making up names, where, where he is at. Because the scripture says here, I'm going to read it. It says in verse 24 and 25 of 1 Corinthians 12, God has combined the members, the members. So we're talking about membership. Is that necessary for salvation? Again, if you're saved, you're going to be a part of the church, local as well as universal. The local church is the local representation of the universal body of Christ. When I see universal, I'm talking about the entire body of Christ as a whole. Every believer makes up that one church, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That local assembly is the representation of that. And the Bible calls us members. God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body but that each part should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. When I was coming up as a very young child, I used to suffer from horrific um, migraine headaches. Uh, I guess to get that from my father, sometimes even my children get those and we bind up any, I think they call those generational curses, whatever you want to call them, it's got to stop. The buck stops here, but it was so bad, I would even have uh, fainting spells and all. And so nevertheless, uh, when when that, that head pounding would begin to occur, my whole body would just be miserable. And then once uh, the migraine headache was gone, it was almost like I'd been in a battle and uh, just had to rest. And then I was able to go uh, forth and uh, live the rest of my day or do the rest of my day after that. But it was a horrific feeling because my head was hurting. And the scripture says here, if one suffers, every part should suffer with it. Uh, not should suffer with it, but every part is actually suffering with it. Basically, one of us is hurting. All of us should be hurting. God forbid that we should rejoice at the downfall 
or the, the um, dismay of somebody else. We are to encourage each other and we are to stand with each other. So do you have to be a member of a local church to be saved? That question is the same as a husband asking, am I yet, if, if, am I yet married to my wife? If I don't live with her, we would look at if somebody walked up and said that to me, I kind of look like, have you lost your mind? What, what kind of I know you all say that that no questions are stupid, but the Bible does talk about foolish questions that stir up strife. That would be a foolish man that would have the audacity to ask somebody. Now, uh, I'm married to my wife, but if she lives one place and I live someplace else and I never do uh, live in the same household with her, am I still married to her? That would be a weird question. And so it's really a weird question to talk about being saved and being a Christian and not gathering with other Christians. We have to remember we're in a Western society, those that are watching from the United States, and I try to remember all the time that there are people that watch from around the world. I have people in Africa that watch, uh, the continent of Africa, the continent of South America, there's folks in Europe uh, and Asia that, that watch. But for much of society, it's been infiltrated by Western culture. But in the Bible, that is Eastern culture. And in that particular culture, especially if you were a Jew, there was no such thing as being a Jew and not gathering at the synagogue. What does that mean? A Jew that doesn't go to the synagogue? That sounds strange. And so that same culture is in the early church, that if you are a believer, you automatically gather with other believers. Corporate worship is something that was expected after the time of Moses. And that's why even after Paul got saved in Acts 9, 26, he tried to join the church. I know some of you all would sing to Paul, what do you mean he tried to join the church? You can't join in. you got to be born. But in Acts 9, 26, it says when he, came, when he came to Jerusalem, when Paul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they didn't say you can't join in, you got to be born in. They said they were afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. They didn't think that he really had become saved, and so they were afraid. But he knew if I'm a believer, a part of being a believer is I'm to gather and join together with other believers because I'm a member of the body of Christ. And again, that's not talking about people that are homebound and bedridden and, 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 and people that are in age where they can't get out anymore. It's not talking about people that are in nations where it's illegal even to uh, convert to Christianity. But according to Acts 9.26, when he was delivered from his sins, the first thing that he did after being baptized in water, after being baptized in the Holy Ghost, was to become a part of the local church. And again, prior to the time of Moses, it was more individualistic. Before the time of Moses, you go to Job chapter 1, verse 5, and that will give you an example of how the culture was for people that had faith in God. The father of the family was basically the priest of the family that would offer up sacrifices and worship on behalf of that family and sacrifices and worship to God. But once the nation was created under the administration of Moses, Moses centralized thing and there was a centralized place of worship, the tabernacle, later on the temple. And so it was known that the saints were to be gathered. Notice when, when he calls uh, Israel out of Egypt, when Moses is called, uh, the first thing he says is that God says for us to come out of Egypt so that we can go into the wilderness and worship as a body, because that's what the Lord is saying. Let my people go so that they can go out into the wilderness and worship me. Let them come together and have a corporate worship service. So that's one of the first things that, that was to take place when God called Moses into leadership. The church is the custodian of everything that pertains to our faith. Because let me deal with some people that are saying, well, I don't worry about uh, going to church or dealing with other believers. I just read the Bible. Where do you think the Bible came from? The Bible came from God. Yes, the Bible came from God, but the Bible came from God and was granted into the church. And it's the church that gathered together and under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and said, this is the canon, C-A-N-O-N. This is the canon. This is the list of official books which we will recognize as scripture, which we will recognize as the infallible, inerrant word of God. Well, how can people get together and do that? Because collectively, 
we as a people coming together represent the body of Christ and God watches over his word to perform it. It's in the church that the ordinances are found, water baptism, uh, uh, that, that's found within the auspices of the church, Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. Some ch churches call it the Eucharist. That is found within the church. But I don't have to have any preacher to do that. I can just take communion myself. But realize this, that's, that's almost the same as um, going to the hospital and somebody telling you, well, I'm not a part of any type of training to be a medical doctor, but I just feel inspired to just go and start doctoring on you and doing surgery. You would think a person like that has lost their mind. And so the body is fitly joined together, Ephesians chapter four, and there therefore must be accountability. And the reason why you have a lot of confusion in the body now is because there's so much wildfire. Everyone feels just inspired, I'm gonna get up. Never been faithful to any local church, never been faithful to, uh, well, you don't have to be faithful to a church, be faithful to God. We, we've just read to you the scriptures that we're one body. And, 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 and it says, don't forsake meeting together. So how can you have a person that has not been faithful at that, but now you wanna go and start a ministry and everything that you were guilty of, you wanna incriminate your members. Some pastors run their churches like cults. Everything is about that pastor. Everything is about that leader, whatever that leader says. You know, it's all about that one individual to the point that it's almost culted. Now, how can you be a leader like that and you were not a proper follower? And I'm not talking about anybody in particular. As a matter of fact, I don't really have anybody in mind as I share this. This is just something that I've seen down through the years, down through the last 40 some odd years. I just, you know, you just watch certain things and just see certain trends and see that, man, this is a regular basis that this happens where you have people that never would listen to anybody, never would, were accountable to anyone, but all of a sudden now you want to go open up a ministry and just run it you know, with the iron fist and be so rigid with everyone uh, like you were in the place of God. And so we reap what we sow. And I thank God that God has blessed me to reap a, a bountiful harvest of blessings. Some wonderful people, wonderful people in my local church, my jurisdiction and evangelism, uh, in the clergy coalition. Well, Hankerson, you got some nuts and you got some uh, uh, difficult people and this and that and the other. Hey, when I was coming up, we used to have, what did you call those things? Cracker Jacks. And in Cracker Jack, in the Cracker Jack box, there was always a little prize at the bottom of the box. And I couldn't, I couldn't wait to get a box of uh, Cracker Jacks so I could get that prize. In order to get that, get that prize, you had to get past some nuts in order to get to the prize. So there's, there's a few nuts here and there. But listen, friends, you know, you, you can't worry about that. You can't focus on that because, again, the church is made up of people. Uh, you just have to make sure that you're not the nut. You have to make sure that you're not a part of that. Make sure that you are a, a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. But any organization, if you're over a, 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 a business, if you're over a corporation, there's going to be difficult people. That is just life. You'll have difficult people in your family. Some of your family members you're not going to get along with, but you don't get rid of them. You may want to, but you don't get rid of them because that's your family. And even if you do get rid of them, it's still your blood. It's still your flesh and blood. So it's within the church that we have the ordinances. It's within the church that we have the orders of ministry, the deacons, the elders, the bishops. Those are three orders that you've had within the church from day one, from the time of Christ. He started off with the apostles. And then after that, there were the um, business elders. According to Acts chapter six, we call them deacons. And then there were the... Uh, bishops, which were basically the assistants to the apostles. These orders are found within the church. And so people wouldn't just get up and say, well, I'm an apostle. Yeah, Paul was called to be an apostle, but notice he first went to join the disciples. He did not set out and say, I'm an apostle without connecting himself to the body. And there was so much controversy in regard to his ministry and so much happening to the point that the council at Jerusalem had to be called so that they could find out in Acts chapter 15, how do we deal with all these Gentiles that are coming into the church? And so Paul respected the result of that particular council. So he was not just somebody independent, just out there. I don't, I don't answer to nobody but God. If you are a pastor and that's your mentality, you're setting yourself up for a major blunder. And if you are a member of a church and you hear your leader say that, you need to pray and ask God to give them some wisdom and, and do like um, uh, Priscilla and Aquila maybe in uh, 
uh, call them aside and show them a more excellent way, like how they did to Apollos, because we don't we don't want to be the type of individual that all I answer to is God. I'm not accountable to anybody. No, we've got to be accountable to each other. You know, even in the ministry of, of Paul, uh, Paul had a Gamaliel, which was his mentor. Uh, Paul had a Barnabas, which was his brother in ministry. And Paul had a Timothy and a Titus. Those were his sons in ministry. So he had a father, he had a brother, and he had a son. And so there was accountability that, that was there. And that is really one of the keys to having a successful, long-term, fruitful ministry. I, I am a young man and in middle age now, but I have been in this ministry well over 30 years and, and this longevity that's there. You know, you, you, don't, you don't see me in and out and up and down and fading in and fading out and, and, and all is it's, it's consistency. And that consistency comes by following that biblical pattern. Again, Paul had a Gamaliel, which was a father figure. He had a Barnabas, which was a brother figure. And then he had a Timothy and a Titus. Those were his sons, a, a, a father, a brother, and a son, a mentor, also someone we're accountable to and someone we impart into, someone we receive impartation, someone we share with and we're accountable to, someone that can tell us, you're wrong. You got up and preached that message. You didn't study. You know you didn't study. You just up there screaming and hollering. And, you know, we may not want to hear it, but you need somebody that can speak into your life like that. You need somebody. No, you were in self today. That, was, that wasn't God. You were, you were in self today. And you were up there just ranting and raving. And, you know, you hadn't prayed like you're supposed to. You know, you hadn't studied like you're supposed to. Somebody, you need to have somebody in your life that speaks to you like that. So you can say, okay, let me just get myself together and make sure I uh, do things the right way. There needs to be some accountability. And then a, a, a son, someone to impart into, into that next generation. Again, the Bible itself, really the New Testament, by the time of Christ, the Old Testament canon or list had already came on the scene, but the New Testament, uh, Matthew all the way to Revelation, it was the church that came together around 325 or so and decided, hey, this is the official list of scriptures in the New Testament that we're going to receive. It is closed. We're not going to add nothing else to it. We're not going to take anything else away. So it's the body of Christ. That was placed within the auspices of the church, uh, the, the, the word of God. It was given unto the church, and the church decided and determined this is the canon, this is the list. Now, one question, and I'm getting ready to close, one question people may ask, um, <laughs> do you have to go to church more than one time a week? Uh, Hankerson, I hear what you're saying. I'm convinced now I got to go to church, but my God, they have Sunday morning service. They have Sunday night service. They got... Tuesday service. They have Friday night service. They got Monday night prayer. They got Saturday brotherhood meeting. They got sisterhood meeting Saturday night. They got the shut-in ministry. They got noonday prayer. Lord have mercy. Do I have to go every single time that the door is open? Well, the early church did meet on a regular basis every day. Acts 2.46 says every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Realize this, at that particular time, the church believed that Jesus was coming at that particular time, even as we believe now that he could come at any moment, but they really had more of a communal lifestyle. They had sold all their goods, they had sold all their possessions, and they actually worshiped like that until Acts chapter 8, where great, great persecution came against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And it's at that time that they were scattered abroad, and that kind of practice was, was broke up. Um, but you should attend church on a regular basis. I'm not telling you how many services to go to, but what I will say is this, um, I believe that I have a strong relationship with God. And a part of that practice has been being in church on a regular basis, being in Sunday school, being in morning service, being in Bible study, being in prayer meeting, um, to being in church once a week. And then when you get there, as soon as you get there, you're ready to go. I wonder about a person's relationship with God um, when it's like that, because we're not just coming to church just to focus on him. We say, forget about yourselves and concentrate on him and worship him. No, it's a body ministry. My final scripture is going to be found in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, because we got that all mixed up. We say, come to church, forget everybody else and focus on him. That's what we do in our personal devotion and private time uh, with God. But in corporate worship, it's not just about me and God. 
And that's why you can't have people doing a whole lot of crazy things in worship services that are not edifying anybody. You know, sometimes people are just speaking in tongues. You know, shut down everything. And folks are thinking it's some kind of mess. Have you ever seen anything like that? I mean, the service is high. Folks are, whoo, Jesus, hallelujah, praising and falling out. The glory of God is falling. All of a sudden, somebody starts speaking in tongues. Like, ha, ba, 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 you know, and so the folks are thinking there's some kind of message that's about to go forth. So they shut down. And the person is ha ba ba shot the last three minutes, and they go sit down somewhere. Now, you're going to stop a service like that. There needs to be some kind of interpretation. You don't shut down a service like that. And then sometimes people get overzealous. You know, folks are just praising them and glorifying God. And folks stop. The Lord says, praise me. The Lord said, well, what do you think we're doing right now? You know, I mean, the folks just rejoicing and magnifying God and lifting him up. And you're going to shut the whole service down talking about praise me, praise me. Well, that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, but when we come together in corporate worship, it's edification, uh, it's, it's glorification to God, but then it's edification to each other as well. And so that's what we do when we come together. And so, again, when you come together, if you have the mindset, I can't wait to get out of here, I wonder, you know, what's going on? Because the, the, your relationship is, let me get this right, vertical, no, hor horizontal and vertical. All right, that's your relationship. If you notice the cross, the cross was vertical as well as horizontal. You know, Jesus is dying on the cross. His hands are nailed, his feet are nailed. And to make up that cross, there's a vertical piece and there's a horizontal piece. And that vertical piece represents our relationship to God and our worship to him when we come together. But then that horizontal piece represents our relationship with each other. That's what it's symbolic of, those two different parts to that cross. And so in that horizontal part, we are brothers and we are sisters. And when you're at the point that, hey, I just don't want to be around the saints, I don't want to be in church, um, you need to pray and, and, and ask God to lift that off of you. Because, you know, the enemy comes to bind you up. He comes to bind up your mind. And that's why the psalmist said, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me. So get yourself together. So why, why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. Get yourself together. Get your mindset together. You type of person, I want to be bothered with saints. I, I don't want to hear no, no, no singing. You, ooh, they beat the tambourine. Just, just stop. You, you beat that tambourine again, I'm going to stuff it down in your throat. Won't you sit down and be quiet, making all that noise, screaming in my ear and all that. See, when a person gets like that, it, it, it makes you wonder what's going on. What's happening within you? You, 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 like young people, you say years ago, you're tripping, you're tripping. Something's wrong with you. You're tripping. You need to get yourself uh, together and ask God, Lord, give me the right kind of frame of mind. And if you notice, certain church services are getting shorter, shorter, shorter. I'm not saying that you have to stay in church five hours on a Sunday, but uh, come on, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, but then you can go and watch Ralph breaks the internet for an hour and a half, the hottest movie that's out there right now, fifty some odd million dollars it got. On uh, Thanksgiving, you can watch uh, Wakanda, the Black Panther, for two hours or more, you know, and it's no big deal. But then when we come to the house of God, let's hurry up and get in. Let's hurry up and get out. Uh, sometime it takes time for God to really move because you cannot hurry him. And you know as well as I know that there's a big difference between a home-cooked meal. You, some, some of you, shame on some of you all. You, 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 you know, especially uh, us, us as a people, you, you people, you folks, other folks on Thanksgiving, they'll have some turkey and they will have the green bean casserole. Uh, they will have the uh, sweet, uh, no, uh, the pumpkin pie and then maybe some mashed potatoes and rolls. And that's it. But when y'all get together, when y'all, you people, when you get together turkey and, and ham and fried chicken and baked chicken and roast beef and candied yams and macaroni and cheese. I feel it right now. Collard greens and sweet potato pie and banana pudding and, and, and all those kinds of, 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 of things. There's just that, you know, it takes time to put that together. You can't just slap something like that together real quick. It takes time to cook those meals. Even one of my favorite uh, meals that I like is yeah, I feel somebody's feel. I know, I know you cook, uh, cooked up a storm, Deacon Trout. Um, but even one of my favorite meals is gumbo. Now, you can go and get you some broth that's already made up and slap that in the pot and put that together. And, um, you know, call, call it gumbo is something that it, it, it looks like it. What, what the scriptures say, a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. 
But um, if you want some real show enough gumbo, it takes a while to make that root with that flour. It takes a while. It takes a good hour or so of stirring because your roux has to become a chocolate color. And the, the when it becomes that deep brown chocolate color, that's when you know that it's just right. So when it comes to our relationship with God, sometimes, you know, that brookie cream, a little dab of do you just won't do you. And there are people dealing with all kinds of, I mean, do you know, folks, I mean, in church are dealing with issues like you just don't believe sexual identity crisis and abuse cases and suicide spirits. And, you know, these are things that are latching on to the people and trying to destroy them. And uh, when you try to do that cattle call worship stop, get in, get out. You know, it's a, well, I need to be delivered. You better hurry, get delivered outside because this service is over. You got to go, you know. And so that's why it's important, even in worship services, like I like how uh, presiding Bishop Blake does West Angeles. You know, the service has a set time, you know, a two hour time frame. And even when they had multiple services, five services or one, two, three, four, five services on a Sunday there at West Angeles, there were, they were an hour and a half. But that's why there's other ministries that are there to minister to the people. What a lot of people don't know, that church has prayer three times a day, 6 a.m., 12 noon, 3 p.m. There's always somebody praying. So there should be some type of means available where people can receive their deliverance. People need the Holy Ghost. How can you make it in this day and time in 2018 as crazy as this world is without the Holy Ghost? How are you going to make it and say if you're on fire for God, don't have the Holy Ghost? How can you preach? And don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Jesus told those disciples, don't you leave Jerusalem without it. Don't just, I don't want you leaving. Well, I got to catch Uber and I got to run down to Beersheba. Don't go to Beersheba. Don't, don't go down there. Well, I got to go up to Galilee so I can get some of that good fish from, from the Sea of Galilee. They got some good fish. If they, don't you leave Jerusalem. I'm talking about you going to get no fish. Don't, don't, don't do that. You stay in Jerusalem until you be endowed with power from on high. And the church stayed together, meeting together for 10 days. And after 10 days, the power of the Holy Ghost began to fall. In the early church, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, it says, when you come together, this is our last scripture, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. All these must be done for the strengthening of the church. It is a body ministry. There is something that you are to contribute. And I know that if there's, you know, a lot of people in the church, you know, you you, you can't just, you know, we learned that a few years ago in Church of God and Christ. You can't just give the mic to everybody. When I was coming up, you have testimony service. I mean, it was, it's be like popcorn. You have two people to come up to the front of the church and sing their song and get the folks all worked up. And then they say, all right, we're not going to open up testimony service. You may stand and sing your song, testify. Sometimes so many people would get up and testify that they said, listen, you can, if you sing, don't testify. If you testify, don't sing. And they tell you that you can't tell at all because, I mean, people would get up. And, I mean, by the time testimony service was ended, that church would be on sanctified Holy Ghost fire like you just would not believe. 2018, you got to watch having an open forum. You know what people are going to do. Um, what people are going to say. You don't know what they're going to do. And I can tell you some crazy things. I won't tell all the stories right now, but I can tell you some crazy things that folks have got up and given in testimonies. And so you'll notice if I have somebody testify now, I'll, I'll put the mic up there and they'll try to, I, oh, I said, nope, I'll hold that mic and you go on and <laughs> testify. And if it's something that if I feel your time is up, I'm going to pull the mic uh, back. So I know that you have to be careful with that, but everybody, should have some type of way to contribute. If it's in a small group, if it's in Sunday school, when we come together, it's necessary. Yes, the ministry is outside of the four walls, but we're to come together and we're to edify each other. In the early church, when they came together for worship, it's almost a similar order of service like you have now in most churches. Prayer, hymn singing, an affirmation of their faith, spiritual gifts going forth, giving taking place, some type of homily or sermon or a teaching, and an invitation for people that are not believers. In 1 Corinthians 20, uh, chapter 14, uh, verse 24, the scripture talks about that when you come together, everybody can testify, uh, uh, prophesy, because if there's unbelievers that come among you, they're going to say, truly God is among you, and they're going to want to join and become a part of what is actually going on. So there was an invitation for people that um, 
uh, were, were unbelievers to become a believer. And when you look at it, really, this is, this is what every church has. I don't care if it's Presbyterian, Methodist, uh, Apostolic, Church of God in Christ, you know, Baptist. I don't care what it is. There's, when you come together for that worship service, Catholic, there's going to be a prayer. There's going to be some kind of song. There's going to be some kind of reading of scripture or affirmation of faith. Uh, there's going to be some type of giving, some type of sermon, uh, some type of invitation for people to uh, become a part of the church. That's, that's, that's something that you find in each worship service and experience. And that comes from the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. And that's what the early church would do. And so it is necessary for every believer to go to church. It is necessary for us to come together and be involved and worship and fellowship with one another because we are a body. If we can't get together down here, you are going to lose your mind when you get to heaven. And the reason why is because these same people that you're trying to avoid, you're going to get to heaven and see all of them. And that last scripture, that was 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 24 through 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 24 through 26. When, we, when you get there and we're all together, now the only thing, like I say, you know, don't, don't keep up a whole bunch of noise when I get to heaven. As people are saying, Hankerson, you're a workaholic, you're just working like crazy. I'm going to rest when I get to heaven. And when I get to heaven, I want to rest. And some of you are talking about walking around heaven all day. Some of you are talking about shouting all over God's heaven. Now, you've had time to do that now. And so I need some peace and I need some quiet. And so if you're going to be walking around on, on uh, heaven all day, don't be keeping up a whole lot of racket and noise, going to another side of heaven somewhere where I can just rest. The wicked will cease from troubling and the weary will be at rest, according to the book of Job. Listen, any closing comments or questions? I know we uh, kind of went on a little while tonight, but um, what I'm asking everybody to do, will you please do this as we get ready to end 2018? You can be a blessing to this ministry by assisting us with sharing the word of God that goes forth from these various teachings. Use it in your Bible study. Use it in your ministerial training. I run into people all across the nation. Uh, I was just in Houston, Texas on yesterday, and people were telling me, uh, hey, you know, we watch you on a regular basis on Tuesday nights. And this is something just was, I was led by the Spirit of God to do um, actually almost two years ago. And I had got on, you may remember, and did a couple teachings, and that was about it. But at the end of last year, the Lord just dropped in my spirit to get on social media and began to do a teaching on a regular basis, not, not a bunch of opinion, not about how I see it, but uh, really just verse by verse scriptural teaching for the people of God to help um, instruct, to edify, to correct false teaching that is out there, um, and then also to stir up people's hunger for more of the word of God and for studying. Many people, many people have been blessed. Uh, someone said uh, to me in Houston, oh, I watch you on a regular basis. And one of the bishops said, yeah, but have you sent an offering? <laughs> and so that was kind of comical. Uh, those of you that want to send an offering, you know you can do that in our on our church Givelify uh, app. Uh, you can do that. Um, I don't do this for personal gain. Some of you, the Lord's used you. You've been touched by various lessons, and you go to my cash app, and I get a notification, bing, what is this? And, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that, but I'm not doing this for uh, gain, not doing it for fame, but doing it out of obedience to the Spirit of the Lord. He is the one that led me to do it, and I trust that you are being blessed. So you can help us by sharing this teaching right now. There's various pages here on um, Facebook that you can share it on, on Periscope. I believe that you're uh, able to share it. If not, um, yeah, because Periscope is tied to Twitter. And so you can, matter of fact, Periscope, Facebook, and Twitter are really all tied together. And so for those of you that are on my Periscope, you can go to um, Twitter. You can tie your feed with Twitter and share there. And I appreciate you all. Thank you so much for those kind words that you're sharing on uh, Periscope. We appreciate that so much. And um, again, this is how you can help us. There's a lot of people also that don't have a Facebook page or Periscope, Twitter, whatever. Uh, we also take these lessons and they are downloaded on our um, uh, YouTube page. They're on our YouTube page. So the last two lessons are about to go on the YouTube page. And uh, there, anybody is able to assess that. They don't have to have a YouTube account. But if they just have access to the internet, they can go and sit down 
you know, get your coffee and get you, um, um, you know, uh, well, I don't get a honey bun. Those things are like 400 calories. Get you, um, well, donuts, the same thing. I don't know, get you something. <laughs> bless you, bless you. I appreciate you. God be the praise. Uh, get you some water, you know, a, a diet uh, uh, Pepsi with some cherry in it and just sit down and just listen and follow verse by verse. Don't take my word for it, but you get your Bible, open it up and just follow along. And I believe that you'll be bountifully blessed. So please do that for us. Uh, we ask that you would share this lesson tonight on um, uh, on all your uh, social media outlets and pages. And also be sure to subscribe to my um, YouTube channel. Um, we do the blog. Uh, I need to update. It's been about a week or so, a couple week and a half or so since I've put out an article. I do it as I'm led by the Spirit of God. And um, there is an article that's coming. I'm going to be dealing with um, uh, black ceilings, uh, torn up jeans, and um, um, what's the word? The, it's the word starts with an F, ends with a T. Um, I don't want to end up getting censored here on um, uh, Facebook because they watch everything. They got me on a two-minute delay or so. Uh, we're going to deal with all of that. Uh, there was a recent controversy online in regard to all of those things. And so we're going to share not as a spokesperson for the uh, church. I am not the there's only one person that can speak on behalf of the Church of God in Christ, and that is the presiding bishop. Um, all I can share is just um, different scriptures to help bring balance. I believe that that's what one of my assignments is as a leader in the body of Christ, not just in the church of God in Christ, but in the body of Christ, because I believe that the gift that God has given me personally um, is not just for one particular organization, it's for the body as a whole, but definitely um, I am full-fledged a part of the movement and denomination that God has placed me within, and I'm so glad uh, to be a part and so glad for the opportunities that I've received opportunities that some people just dream about and that I definitely don't deserve. God has just richly blessed and opened uh, doors and he's been very good to me. The saints of the church of God in Christ have just been wonderful. Um, and when I get a chance, I'm gonna tell my story, the whole story of how the saints uh, embraced me even as a child and said, we are gonna be your family. We are gonna make sure that you are taken care of. And that's what the saints, I thank you, Lord. That's what the saints have done. And the saints have been wonderful. <laughs> the saints are so wonderful to my family that when the kids were little, uh, Elijah was being chastised. And uh, Elijah told me, because <laughs> Hankerson's got a little smart mouths, you know, and so uh, the Lord has to, and he's, he's blessed me to learn to be tactful and all of that, but that's just um, that's just something in a, in a Hankerson. And uh, don't look at me funny, because some of y'all the same way. And so I've had to taper that and use diplomacy and all. But uh, Elijah, when he was little, I really got after him. I was getting after him, and I just say it that way. I was getting after him. He says, I'm telling the saints that you got after me. I'm telling the saints. And I say, you tell the saints this, pop, you know, so you can imagine what happened. But anyways, um, there's such respect. And uh, one time he was, he was being disciplined. Saints, saints, call them the saints. And so I just thank God for the people of God. Listen, my time is up, but I've enjoyed being with you. I could go on, but our time is up. Next week, please join me in Florida. I'll have the um, city for you uh, next Tuesday night to share with you where we're heading. We're heading to Atlanta, Georgia as well in the next few weeks. Uh, where else is this? Springfield, Missouri. Uh, we're heading there. Uh, where else? Where else? Where else? Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, so in the next few weeks, Illinois, Chicago, we'll be telling you about these various um, engagements. And those of you that are in these cities, please come. If you hear that I'm coming to your city, please come out and uh, 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 be with us in those services uh, so that you can pray along with us for God to bless the people of God. And anytime you're in the city of St. Louis, don't fail to come and join, I believe, the greatest church in the nation and that is the Life Center International Church of God in Christ. I'm getting ready to end now, and I'm actually heading into the pulpit, and we'll be heading straight to the pulpit to teach the Word of God to the people of God. Tonight, I'm teaching from the life of Elijah in 1 Kings um, chapter 18. And what's so amazing about that man of God, this man had such a relationship with God. He said, it ain't going to rain until I say so. 
and and he didn't even have any scripture verses to back him up on that and god backed him up and then he prayed again and then the rain began to come forth powerful man gathered up on the people on the top of mount carmel and i mean put himself out there the god that answers by fire let him be god and god honored his word caught up into heaven god gave him a personal rapture and and and, and, and caught him up and then uh i'm looking to pretty soon probably next few months be looking to uh come back to tacoma um and then he was so powerful that when jesus was on the mount of transfiguration moses and elijah met him at, at the top of mount transfiguration some say it was mount Tabor, whichever mountain it was elijah and moses met with jesus and discussed his death can you imagine being so powerful that you are called into a meeting with the son of god mm, thank you jesus to discuss his imminent death my god that's a powerful relationship with god and we don't even really know what his origin is all we know is elijah the tishbite folks don't even really know what a tishbite was you know you can go to different scholars and they'll tell you they think it may have been this think it may have been that but it's just all speculation we don't even know what a tishbite was where he came from but one thing we know is that he had a powerful relationship with god i'm excited i'm getting ready to teach on that here in the next few minutes at life center if you're in the city of st louis you need to come on and join us, 8500 Halls Ferry, 8500 Halls Ferry, Sunday morning service at 10 o'clock, Tuesday night Bible study at 7 o'clock. I hit the pulpit as soon as I uh, leave out from here, and I go and teach uh, the Word of God. Just enjoy teaching. Listen, time is up, but again, please be sure to share this with someone. Uh, God bless all of you on my Periscope. I appreciate you so much. We'll look forward to seeing you next time, same time, same place. Lord willing, be blessed. And also, God bless each and every one of you on Facebook. I end this time with the words that have become the theme of my life. Every time I turn around, God keeps on blessing me. Be bountifully blessed.